I'm Eric Bernjolson. Uh, that's Andy there. And uh, what our plan is for today is we'll give a, a, a short talk, giving a little bit of overview of some of the themes of our book, Machine Platform Crowd. And then we're looking forward to a really uh, lively discussion and hearing what some of your thoughts are. That we learned a tremendous amount in, in working on this book and our research from going around visiting lots and lots of companies and organizations and people who are facing interesting challenges and opportunities. And we want to hear some of them from you. So our book, our work, our research, our lives really dedicate to understanding the digital economy and how it's uh, transforming work and organizations. But there's a, a, a giant paradox at the core of the digital economy. Um, we all know about the amazing and wondrous technologies that uh, are sweeping and the excitement, whether it's from self-driving cars or machines that can diagnose diseases better, um, in artificial intelligence, the rise of platforms, the ability to tap into the billions of people in the crowd. And it's hard not to be excited about that. People like Bill Gates say that innovation has never been faster. And, and we agree, and we see that. But at the same time, if you look at the, the economic statistics, as we must, uh, it's pretty disappointing. Um, productivity growth is not soaring. Um, median income has stagnated or even arguably fallen a bit over the past 20 years. A lot of people really aren't benefiting. Uh, companies are uh, stagnating and American industry is struggling. So how can this be? What is going on? Well, we think a big part of the story is, is that the problem isn't in the technologies, it's in us. It's in us managers, it's in us as employees, in us as policymakers. We aren't taking advantage of these technologies to transform the economy the way we could be doing and the way we should be doing. Um, and making this kind of transformation is actually quite difficult. Um, having a technology by itself doesn't automatically mean you get the benefits of that technology. You need to make a thousand and one, a million and one small and big and medium sized complementary innovations. And this is not uh, the first time this happened. You know, we, we can't say with certainty what's going to happen going forward, but we have a pretty good clue from looking at history of what's happened with earlier waves of technological revolution and how they have played out. So let me describe a little bit about one that I think we have a pretty good sense of what happened, and that's electricity. Um, uh, 100, 120 years ago, factories, can we bring up the, factories uh, look very different than they do today. So factories looked a bit like this. Um, and uh, there were many of these that, that were all over the landscape of, uh, of uh, America, especially in, in uh, New England and the Mid-Atlantic and, and, and the Midwest. Uh, they were multi-story factories. And if you went inside them, what you would see is there was this big, gigantic, really, steam engine, sometimes water wheel, uh, in the middle of the factory. And that was powering all of the equipment, and that was all the machinery, and helping it churn out products. And the way the individual machines were powered was through a series of belts and loops and crankshafts. And it was actually, if you've ever been inside one, how many people have visited one of these kinds of factories? It's kind of a, yeah, great. So you know, it's kind of like a, a Rube Goldberg set of contraptions of wires. You have to duck a little bit um, as they all spin and, and, and turn around. That was not a joke about the Apple Goldberg action. I told that to <laughs> we, I, I need to clarify my co-author here a little bit. Yeah, those of you who were around 150 years ago know that. <laughs> But luckily, there's still many of them around that have been preserved, and it's fun to go visit them. Um, they power the equipment. Um, and th the thing about it is, it, is, it is if you try and make a crankshaft too long, it's just going to break. You know, the torsion on it's too hard, high. So they clustered the machinery in close <coughs> to that steam engine. The ones that needed the most power would be the closest. Others could be a little bit further away with, with other belts. Um, and they were smart enough not to just do it in two dimensions, they did it in three dimensions, so you could minimize the overall radius. And you go in there and you see it's kind of, things are all whiz, spinning and whizzing around. Um, so that's the way factories worked in the steam or the water wheel era. Once electricity was invented and, and they were able to make uh, electric motors, then they went back and said, hey, we gotta take advantage of this amazing new technology. And the first thing they did, they went back to many of the factories and they retrofitted them. So they went in and they tore out that steam engine wasn't easy, but they pulled it out, and then they went and got the biggest electric motor they could find, and they stuck it back where the steam engine was. And then they pulled, hooked up all the same pulleys and crankshafts and got back to work. So was this a big increase in productivity? Was this a fundamental change? No, it was barely measurable. Um, 
excellent uh, economic historians like Paul David have studied this, and they found that there was not even a blip in productivity. You couldn't, you couldn't even measure it. Fair enough, they were retrofitting factories. They started building new factories from scratch. A sheet of paper, let's build a new factory. What did the new factories look like? They looked like this. <laughs> Just the same thing. They build them up. Um, there was some smart architect engineer, maybe from MIT, and they had a big blueprint. And they took their marker out, and they made a big X through the steam engine. They wrote in the corner, put electric motor here instead, and said, OK, my work is done. Get to work. And then they would build a new factory. Pulleys, crankshafts, wheels spinning, multi-story. Is that a big improvement in productivity? Of course not. It took about 30 years. It took about till the 1920s until you finally started seeing a fundamentally different way of organizing production and manufacturing. Uh, and it's the way things look today is these single story factories where every single piece of equipment, instead of having being hooked up by pulleys and crankshafts, every single piece of equipment had its own electric motor. It turns out that electric motors, you know, you can make them big, you can make them medium, you can make them the size of a watch, you can make them any size you want, and they don't have those thermal inefficiencies that, that steam engines do. And that just gives you a men tremendous amount of flexibility to just lay things out however you want. And some people finally got the smart idea, hey, we don't have to arrange this based on who needs, which, which piece of equipment needs more power. We can arrange it based on what? On the flow of materials, on workflow, on assembly lines. They invented a new way of organizing production. And once they did that, did that lead to an increase in productivity? Oh my god, you bet. According to Paul David's research, 100%, 200%, even 300% increases in the throughput of manufacturing once they rethought production. But the key point is that this took a generation, 30 years, long enough for a bunch of people to retire. So, and, and there are many, many other examples of these waves of technology, whether you go back to the steam engine or uh, the rise of, of how automobiles affected uh, the, uh, the economy. Um, the technology itself is a tremendous catalyst, but reinventing business processes, reinventing business models, reinventing companies and industries is really where you get the big value from. So, so going forward, let's think going forward. Let's look specifically, start, we're looking at processes, and then we're going to look at companies, and we're going to look at industries. So the book itself is really about these three things, machine, <coughs> platform, and crowd. We call it the triple revolution, this transformation that's going on in the e economy. Um, it's really three pairs of changes, going from mind to machine, and, and rebalancing it. We don't think we need to turn, we shouldn't try and turn the dial all the way and just to say machines now do everything that minds do. That's not realistic. Um, but there's a rebalancing, and most companies don't move far enough over to the machine end of the spectrum. Similarly, there's a transformation going on from products to platforms. If you look at five of the five most valuable companies on the planet, they all are platform companies, and they derive a big part of the reason that they're so valuable is because of the interesting and sometimes very counterintuitive economics of platforms. Luckily, some of our colleagues and others, Nobel Prize winners, have worked through the economics of platforms and, and so-called two-sided networks. And now that we understand them a little bit better, we can uh, make sense of some of the bizarre strategies that companies are making, sometimes giving things away for free, scaling very rapidly. It seems helter-skelter, but there's a, a, a rhyme and reason underlying that if you understand the economics. And finally, there's a transformation from the core to the crowd. And what we mean by that is the core people in the organization, the, the people, um, the experts in the company inside the boundary walls, historically have been the ones that have been driving all the innovation and strategy. But now we have, for the first time in history, a digital network that allows us to connect to billions of brains, billions of smart people. And not only can they all tap in to the collective knowledge that we have in many sources from Wikipedia to Kaggle elsewhere, but they can also contribute to it. And uh, successful organizations have figured out a way to leverage and tap into that with, and we'll show you later, just some absolutely breathtaking results. In each case, as I said, there's a, there's a rebalancing going on. We think companies aren't making those, that transition fast enough. Uh, with, we're hoping that with the help of this book and the help of all you guys thinking more about it, it's going to take a lot less than 30 years this time to take full advantage of these technologies, but there's a lot of hard work yet to be done. So let me start by talking about that first one, the transition from uh, mind to machine. And uh, 
historically, um, people have been making decisions in organizations based primarily on opinion and um, making decisions straight from the gut. And this is not just in, in big American companies, but if you think about it, all through history, anytime there's a really important decision, uh, the group of decision makers would get together around a table and they talk and they debate and each would give their opinions. And when they were done, they would go with the hippo. So if you guys, you guys familiar with the phrase hippo? Some of you guys are, you, yeah. You're smiling because I'm not talking about the African animal. Uh, hippo in this context stands for the highest paid person's opinion. <laughs> so so that, is, that is the strategy. And you know, let's face it, that's the way decisions have historically been made because you had no other way. As, uh, as uh, Jack Clark once, uh, Jim Clark once said, um, you know, if we've got facts and data, let's go with that. If all we have opinions, let's go with mine. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, what else can you do? And, uh, and it's, it's not a terrible way to make decisions. I mean, it's built some, some great companies and some great empires, um, but the human brain is actually pretty buggy. And we know now from research from, from Danny uh, Kahneman and others that there's some uh, recurring flaws, mistakes. We're all, we've all been able to play the game where you see your own blind spot. And you know, most of us don't know about the blind spot until someone shows you the blind spot. Well, we have dozens of cognitive blind spots and systematic mistakes over and over. And there's some scary examples of that. Um, but now, we have geeks who are able to tap into data and help us make decisions more effectively. And really, the key enabler isn't so much that we have more and better geeks now, although we do. The key enabler is that we have just an amazing amount of data that we didn't have. The amount of digital data, terabytes, petabytes, zettabytes of data that we didn't have access to before is just exploding. And that's because of the digital revolution that is instrumenting just about everything on the planet. And so we can, instead of having opinions about what we think is happening, we can have data about what we know is happening. And that opens up a new way of decision making. And in particular, um, if you do some comparisons of when we've used um, uh, algorithms to make decisions when, versus when we have the hippos, the human judgment, uh, if you do studies of this, what you find is that about 48% of the time, they do about equally well. Almost half the time, the algorithms do demonstrably better, which leaves hardly ever that we see that the experts are clearly better. It's just an overwhelming runaway success for applying these in many, many types of applications. And the, the data also show that organizations are adopting this very quickly. Um, with the help of the US Census Bureau, we went out and surveyed 40,000 large American plants, rep very representative. Um, and uh, 30,000, I should say, and what we found was that there was about a three times increase in the use of data-driven decision-making. That is, this checklist of criteria we had for whether or not they were data-driven or using uh, mainly judgment to make their key decisions. Um, and so there's been a big increase in that, and the reason for that is there's, it's a great, there's like a sucking power towards making those kinds of decisions because those companies are more productive and more profitable. And over time, we'll see more and more companies doing it. It's still actually less than uh, a majority. It's about 35% of the companies that are, are doing that now. But we see a big shift in that direction because of this. Now, the other big change is not just data-driven decision making, but the other big change in the mind-machine trade-off is um, moving from artificial intelligence to machine learning, and especially the subcategory of deep learning. And let me just touch on that for a few minutes, and then uh, we'll, we'll look at the other section. So it's just very striking how we can now have machines that not only follow our own instructions and do what we, we tell them, uh, Andy and I call that the first wave of the second machine age. Machines moving from uh, taking care of muscle and, and automating muscle work to brain work. But now we're in the early stages of the second wave of the second machine age, and that is when machines learn on their own. And here's a good example, um, machines learning to play simple things like video games. and. Uh, in this case, uh, DeepMind gave the uh, raw pixels of the Atari video game break Breakout and 33 other video games to a machine. And they didn't describe what was there. These are balls or objects or paddles. They just said, here's the pixel string, the dots. And they said, here's a controller. You can move the paddle back and forth. I'm not going to tell you what's good or bad. And here's the score. So try to maximize that. And if we go ahead and play it, you can see, go ahead and play the video, we can see uh, what's, oh, it's been playing, okay. So what you see is um, 
that the machine learned quite rapidly and learned, whoops, <laughs> okay. And, and, and at first, the machine actually was not very good, and if it, you see it playing, it was sometimes lucky enough to hit the ball, but many other times it just missed, just kind of randomly moving around. But then it got feedback about what got scores and what did better, and after about 300 games, it started playing about as well as a good human teenager, <laughs> almost always uh, hitting it, but they just let it keep learning. And after about 500 games, um, it started doing things that the uh, engineers hadn't ima imagined it would do. Um, I talked to these guys, and they said they didn't know that there was this strategy where you like just keep poking away at the side over here and get the ball to go around back, and you get a lot of additional <laughs> points. And they were like, whoa, that's cool. I didn't know you could do that. Um, so the machines were not only learning to do what humans do, but, but they used the same algorithm to get more and more points. And what's striking is that the same basic technique, reinforcement learning, the same better basic um, uh, AI techniques, they used not only to play um, Breakout, but they gave it uh, dozens of different Atari video games. And a little bit more than half of them, they quickly got to superhuman performance. Others, they didn't get to superhuman performance. It has to do with the fact that we still have some, some skills that the machines don't have. But with these ones that have quick feedback, like this, or like Space Invaders, it learned quite quickly to get superhuman. So there are three big application areas. I'll go through these quickly because I know that you guys have heard about them here at Aspen. Uh, vision, interacting with the fi in, in language, vis interacting with the physical world and problem solving. Uh, vision has just been remarkable. Um, you can look at different uh, pictures. And uh, after the talk, you'll go out and grab some muffins. Make sure you grab the right ones. Um, <laughs> but, um, but there's a big database called ImageNet um, that sort of is a good test bed for how well machines and humans can recognize objects. And as recently as 2010, machines had about a 30% error rate. And it hadn't really improved a whole lot for a long time. Um, but then there was this inflection point where it suddenly got much, much better. And that was when they first started using these deep learning algorithms, deep neural nets. Um, and it's a new approach to artificial intelligence that requires a lot more computer power. But once you uh, do it that way, you can get much better at the point now where they are better than humans on ImageNet, better than humans at recognizing that. Um, and that's uh, not just uh, vision systems, but you also see it with speech systems, where it went from 8.5% error rate <coughs> down to 4.9% error rate. And, and I think what's striking about this particular graph is this is not over a 10-year period. This is over about a 10 or 11-month period. <laughs> it's very rapid improvement. And in each case, we're getting to the point where we're just about the threshold of being equal to or better than humans at these key kinds of tasks. And that's not just a difference in degree, that's a difference in kind. Think of it, if you're an entrepreneur or a manager and uh, you've got two ways of solving a problem, um, you're gonna go with the, with the better way. You're gonna switch over. So once the machines start getting better than humans, it's like raising the temperature of water. Once it crosses the boiling point, you have a real fundamental transition. And that, of course, has led to self-driving cars, uh, to robots like Baxter that works for about $4 an hour. It doesn't need to be trained, it uh, doesn't need to be uh, programmed. You can train it just by showing it examples. Um, Google's DeepMind is using it in processes. Very similar technology to that video game. They said, well, you know, our data centers are like a giant video game, if you think about it. They've got all this uh, data coming in from different dials and switches. Um, they have uh, controllers we can adjust, uh, dozens or thousands of them. And they've got a score, which in this case is what's your power consumption? Can we make your power consumption more efficient? Um, and so they gave that data to the learning algorithm. The data centers had already been optimized by some very smart humans, um, operations research experts. So the managers were a little skeptical. They were going to be able to squeeze much more from that stone. But it turns out they, they were able to make it dramatically more efficient. That before they turned on the machine learning system, um, it had relatively high inefficiency. It got dramatically more efficient, about 15% more efficient. And then when they turn it off again, it went back to, to the old levels of inefficiency. Now, that is worth hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And it's, it's not just in data centers. Uh, you, it doesn't take imagine, much imagination to apply it to lots of other data centers throughout the world. But you can think about applying it to any kind of continuous operation in organization. Um, you can think of it optimizing your inventories or your supply chains. If you feed the data in, these machines can take into account a lot of variables they couldn't otherwise. So we'll take questions um, in a little while, but, but yeah, we'll, uh, we'll come back to that. Let me just uh, 
one last example here, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Andy. And that is that um, um, it's not just in manufacturing. It's also happening in services, in finance, in, in medicine, in retailing, lots of other areas. We were talking to folks down at, at J.P. Morgan. And just very recently, they're applying these systems to a lot of different kinds of knowledge work as well. So this is a, a revolution that's underway. We're in the very early stages of it. Most of the examples we describe have not spread out through the economy very much yet, but we can see them coming, and we expect that the next 10 years will be just breathtaking in terms of the economic impact because the technology is already there. But let me give the uh, controller over to Andy, and he will tell you about platforms and crowds, and we'll take, then we'll go ahead and take questions. Good. Eric, thanks very much. And again, thank you all for coming out so early on a Saturday. Uh, as Eric points out, our business processes and the way we accomplish them successfully are moving pretty quickly from hippos over to geeks, and a lot more machines are being combined with our minds. I want to talk about two other really fundamental things that are going on. Uh, well, first of all, at the level of the company, there are some pretty important changes happening. Both Eric and I have careers in business academia that are longer that are longer than I would care to admit, actually. And for that whole time, when, we, when we've been trying to absorb the latest thinking and to give advice, we sound like personal trainers over and over again. For one very specific reason, the classic piece of business advice for uh, well over two decades now has been to focus on your core. In the same way that your trainer keeps trying to strengthen your core, we keep trying to strengthen the core of the organization. You've read books and articles about the core capability, the core competence, the core process, the core hires in your organization, and the message is really, really clear. There's a fairly small set of things that are very important for what you want to do. You better get really good at them and build up your internal capability at them. The other stuff is context. You can get rid of the context, put that outside the four walls of your company. Inside the four walls, you better focus on your core. And that's not necessarily wrong in the same way that minds are not irrelevant now that we have extraordinarily powerful machines. But what we learned when we were writing this book, and it continues to blow me away, is how powerful the crowd is instead of the core. And by the crowd here, I honestly just mean these hundreds of millions of people, soon to be billions of people, random, weirdo strangers that are out there on the internet that you can tap into in all kinds of crazy ways. The, one of the single best examples that we came across when writing the book was this study, which was done by our colleague, Kareem Lakani, who was educated at MIT, um, lost the gospel and moved up the river a little bit, but we don't hold it against him because he still does fantastic work. Kareem did a study where he partnered up with the National Institutes of Health to find out if we could speed up and improve the accuracy of the way we sequence human white blood cells. Our white blood cells have weird genomes. We'd like to be able to sequence them to learn more about human health, but it's hard to do. And of course, you use computers for this. The National Institutes of Health, when they started the work, had an algorithm that performed at the level of that triangle there. And what that means is it could do a run of sequences in about four hours with about 70% accuracy. Is that good? Is that bad? Can we do better? These were really open questions. There was a faculty member at the Harvard Medical School who worked on it and got up to this level of performance, where he was able to reduce the time down from four hours to about one hour and get the accuracy up to 75%. That's a big improvement. That's fourfold plus an uh, efficiency bonus. Both the National Institutes of Health and Harvard Medical School are by any definition part of the core of the medical establishment. Where things got interesting is where Kareem then worked with a company called Topcoder that does kind of crowdsource software development, and they did a two-week project to say, gang, can we beat these benchmarks? And all they did was upload a bunch of data to help them work on the problem and say, come one, come all, work on this, give it a try. We don't care who you are, we don't care where you're from, we don't care if you have fancy degrees or not, see what you can do. And this is actually what the crowd came up with. So every one of these circles represents a submission in this context from the crowd. And like you see, a lot of them are less accurate than the baseline performance of the core. Those red circles are where things get really interesting because every one of those red circles is simultaneously faster and more accurate than anything that, that the core had been able to come up with. The best circles there, the ones up farthest to the left, are doing their work on the order of 10 seconds and they're up around 80% accuracy, which we think is pretty close to the theoretical accuracy you could hit. So like you can imagine, Kareem and his colleagues went and interviewed these red circles <laughs> to find out what kind of biomedical geniuses they were, and it turns out most of them were students, they were quite young, not a one of them 
came from the life sciences industry. There was not one computational geneticist, that was not, there was not one professional biologist among them. These were all deeply geeky people who came from very, very far away and happened to, to see an aspect of the problem that the core had not come across yet. So when Kareem published this, we called him up and we said, is this the most extraordinary thing you've ever seen? And he honestly said to us, no, it's about average. He said, when I do my work, I set up these crowdsourced competitions. When I do my work, if, uh, if I don't see this magnitude of performance improvement over the core, over the baseline when we start, Kareem said, I think I've done my work incorrectly. I think I set up the competition incorrectly. So these are the kind of benefits that appear to be out there if you can tap into the energy of the crowd. For me, m maybe the craziest part of this whole story is that the total prize money offered for this two-week contest was $6,000, and you get this kind of energy back. We're starting to see really interesting new organizations and companies come up that are inherently crowd-focused as opposed to co core-focused. One of the places this is going to play out very quickly is in the investment industry. A lot of us know that the, the absolute thoroughbreds of the investment world these days are a small handful of quant trading firms. You've, we've heard of Renaissance, D.E. Shaw, Two Sigma. These are rock star firms in the investing world. Uh, Renaissance actually is no longer taking outside money. They just don't need money from the rest of us anymore because Bloomberg said it's one of the greatest money-making machines in the history of capitalism. You guys are the core of the investment industry. Eric and I found a really interesting company when we were writing the book called Quantopian, which is trying to be a crowdsourced quantitative hedge fund. And the insight of the founders was kind of interesting. As far as they could tell, there are about three to 5,000 professional quant investors working in companies like Renaissance and D.E. Shaw. And their thought experiment was, what are the chances? Those are the absolute best three or 5,000 quantitative investors in the world. And when you phrase the question that way, the answer is really interesting. It's clear some of the best people in the world are working inside the company, inside those companies. Is it the case that all of them are? What percent of the actual amazing quant investing talent out there is somewhere else in the world? So they launched Quantopian to find out. They're going to put a, um, f a fund available, I believe, later this year. But to get ready and to test their theory, they've run 19 quantitative investing competitions so far. Of those 19, four have been won by quant traders. One has been won by somebody else inside the finance industry. The other 14, should surprise us a little bit less now, have been won by total, complete outsiders to investing in general. And we said, who are, you, who are these people winning these 14 contests? They said, oh, you know, geeks, super geeks, young ones, old ones, oil and gas exploration people, physicists, applied mathematicians, just this, this amazing constellation, this energy of deep, deep talent out there that happens to be appropriate for this kind of problem. Eric and I think that that is going to be, that's probably much more the rule than the exception. And if we can find different ways to tap into what the crowd can do, pretty extraordinary things can happen. The last level that we want to talk about before we throw it open and, and see what we all want to talk about is the level of the industry. And I spent my whole career believing what our colleagues at McKinsey say on their website, which is that there is no substitute for knowing an industry inside and out. Uh, you know, all of us, I think a lot of us in this room have probably read stuff that Michael Porter wrote, and his whole contribution was to say, look, you got to focus on the industry because industries are very different from each other. They have different sets of players, they have different cost structures, there are barriers to entry. You got to focus on the industry and understand the particularities of it. And to say it one more time, this is not dead flat wrong, but what we're learning in this era of silly digital progress is actually in lots of, of pretty economically important ways, industries are much more alike than they are different. Uh, I would never have thought that the worldwide smartphone industry, the industry for urban transportation around the world, and the industry for group exercise were more similar than different. That seemed like that would be a ludicrous thing for me to think. And in fact, uh, a lazy business school professor final exam would be to do something like tee up these three industries and say to your students, compare and contrast. And if they compared, they would fail, right? What I was hoping for is con show, show me you understand how different these industries are from each other. If I got a student who on her exam said, you know what, these industries are really all the same because they have a bunch of buyers and a bunch of sellers. I would have failed her immediately for two reasons. First of all, thanks Captain Obvious. 
Second of all, that's not even correct. This is not even the right way to look at it. The worldwide smartphone industry does not have a bunch of buyers and a bunch of sellers. It has hopefully a huge number of sellers out there around the world and a, a huge number of buyers out there around the world and a very small number of sellers, smartphone companies out there around the world. That was what I would have walked around thinking. I take some comfort from the fact that uh, I'm not the only one making that category mistake. One of our favorite parts of writing the book was to point out that no less an authority than Steve Jobs got this deeply, deeply wrong 10 years ago. The iPhone is just about exactly 10 years old. And when he launched it, uh, um, what Walter Isaacson taught us when he wrote his book was Jobs being the control freak that he was, wanted to maintain extraordinarily tight control over all the apps on the phone. He knew there were gonna be these things called apps on the phone. He thought Apple was gonna be writing all of the apps that all of us have access to. And that was his really strong belief. And there was a year-long struggle inside the company with some of his executives and with some of his board members to say, Steve, you have to open up the iPhone. And for a year, he said no. And then finally, they convinced him, and he did a small experiment a little less than 10 years ago. In July of 2008, the App Store opened up for the first time with about 500 apps written by outside developers. They came back a day later. Those apps had been downloaded like 383,000 times, and they realized they had unleashed this crazy energy in the world. So at that point, Jobs opened up app development to the crowd. And they put some quality controls on it, but they stopped trying to so tightly control everything. And what they did with that one move was they changed the nature of that industry, they changed the nature of competition in that industry, and all of us probably agree, they changed the world by doing that because all of a sudden the industry started to look like this, where there actually were a lot of sellers. They weren't sellers of phones, they were sellers of apps. And there were a lot of people out there who wanted to buy them, and the more buyers out there, the more app developers wanted to, to develop for that digital platform. The more app developers out there, the more we wanted to buy the iPhone as opposed to something else. And we kicked off one of the great 10-year runs of business value creation and profitability in the history of American industry. And it's actually not the case that Apple makes all of the profits in the worldwide smartphone uh, device industry. That's not what's going on. What's actually going on is that Apple makes more than all of the profits in the worldwide smartphone industry. We came across this analysis that said, look, for one quarter in 2016, Apple made about 103% of the total profits in the device, the worldwide smartphone device industry. Samsung made something less than 1%. Everybody else involved in that huge, global, really important industry lost money. And what's amazing here is with that, with that one kind of mental switch, the action changed, and it changed from the product level Products, beautiful products, smartphones are still important. They're not sufficient anymore. The action went from the product up to the platform, and the value creation migrated from the device up to the ecosystem as well. And we're seeing this happen in more and more industries. Urban transportation, all of us know about the transportation network companies that are changing the way we get around cities. There's an interesting wrinkle here. I'm kind of used, I'm a little bit cynical in some ways by now, I'm kind of used to companies talking about their amazing corporate culture to disguise their lousy financial performance. It's a thing you see once in a while. Uh, Uber's in this interesting position. They're talking about their amazing financial performance to detract from their terrible corporate culture. They're, they're trying to like fake us out with, with their results and their crazy growth. And what, what I conclude from this is if you get the economics and you get the technology right, you can run a lousy organization, a very dysfunctional organization for a long time. The advice here is not, Real to build a lousy organization with great economics and great technology, uh, that doesn't work. And what we're seeing with Uber right now is exactly how much stress comes eventually if you build a dysfunctional corporate culture. But wow, if you get the economics and the technology right, you can go for a long, long run. And they've built this amazing digital platform. I would have thought that group exercise is probably the last industry on the planet to be transformed by a platform. But there's a wonderful company out there called ClassPass that we found when writing the book. Any ClassPass members out there? Uh, how many, do you, do you love ClassPass? So ClassPass is this great platform, this digital platform, shows up as an app on your phone that makes this intriguing proposition to people like our colleague here. And they say, look, we are a virtual gym. Sign up with us for a monthly fee and you can take yoga class one day, Pilates class the next day, spin, you can go to kickboxing at these gyms all around your city and in different cities where you travel. What ClassPass doesn't own any of those gyms. On the flip side, 
they go to gym owners and they say, look, you probably have a few empty spaces in most of your classes throughout the week. You're making absolutely zero revenue from those spaces. Give them to us. And we're, we're clever enough that we'll figure out about how many empty spaces you're going to have in that class. Give those to us, let us reserve the right to fill those. And we're gonna pay you per person that walks in to take that class. You should be willing to take that deal because in general, some revenue is better than no revenue. Do you wanna take some time out and write that down? I think it's a, I think it's a fundamental lesson. <laughs> And, and lots of studio owners around the world said, you know what, some revenue is better than no revenue, we'll sign that up. And then again, you get this digital platform, you get this wonderful virtuous cycle that keeps going, whereas there are more exercise classes with more variety, more people who want to exercise show up, as those warm bodies, literal in this case, warm bodies are out there, more gyms show up. And what ClassPass and the other great platform builders are doing is they're realizing a few things are really important here. The most obvious economic thing here is network effects. The fact that as more people are doing this, it becomes more and more attractive. And in particular, ClassPass is a great example of a two-sided network. More gyms mean bring more individuals, more individuals bring more gyms on board. All of the great platform builders that Eric and I talked to when we were writing the book are obsessive about the user experience and the user interface. It is hard to do complicated things via a tiny screen. You gotta work really, really hard on it. They also control who's in, who's out. They curate the membership. They have rules for what good participation looks like. And they monitor that stuff pretty carefully. And then finally, the digital platforms today and tomorrow are a paradise for all kinds of different geek, for operations researchers who have been working on yield management for airlines and hotels for decade. You can now do that for group exercise classes if you have enough of them. Behavioral economists love this stuff. All kinds of people are getting together and they're solving some really tough problems. How would we do dynamic pricing in this world? How do we match supply and demand? Can I offer millions upon millions of people a deeply personalized experience? Yes, you can. And then finally, can we actually bring trust into transactions where it was not really available before? Once you have some level of trust, all kinds of things can blossom. If somebody had told me 10 years ago that I would be hopping in the back seat of strangers' cars all around the world <laughs> without a second thought and getting to my destination saying bye and they would know that they were going to get paid, that's ludicrous, except it's happening at scale all over the world now. Even weirder is the fact that people are sleeping in strangers' bedrooms halfway around the world <laughs> with nary a second thought. And the reason Airbnb and, and Uber can do that is not that we've suddenly become good, it's that their trust mechanisms allow us to realize most people actually are good. You can trust the vast majority of people and the ones they can't, we're gonna kick off this platform pretty carefully. So uh, let's wrap up and then see what people wanna talk about. Eric and I kind of believe that the business playbook, it, some aspects of it are rapidly be, is rapidly becoming obsolete. We need to rewrite aspects of it. So first of all, the optimal division of labor, the work that we give to minds versus machines is shifting very quickly because we know how, how powerful the data-driven algorithms are, and in this crazy world of machine learning, the machines are getting much more capable much more quickly. The crowd is, the conservative way to say it, is often more capable than the core. Uh, I think that's uh, lowballing it. I think the crowd is usually more capable even in the core of great organizations, and we're gonna find that out. And then finally, value creation and value capture are moving very quickly from a product-centric view of the world up to a digital platform-centric view of the world. These are three pretty profound things happening. They're interacting, they're all happening at once, which is why Eric and I talk about a triple revolution. We're in the early stages of it, and things are gonna get really, really interesting, uh, which is, I guess, why we wrote the book. Let's stop there. We would love to see questions, comments, reactions. Thank you very much. And so we have about 10 minutes. Uh, if you wanted to go ahead and ask your question now, or- Can you wait for the microphone, though, please, so we get this captured? Yeah. <laughs> could you explain the algorithms? Um, it seems, could you explain, algor I'm Mike Sogard from Indianapolis. Could you explain algorithms and how they're created? It seems like they're created by people and maybe in much more of a disciplined uh, fashion than just the daily. This is one of the most exciting changes that's happened. And you're right, for, for most of the past 40, 50 years, the important algorithms were all created by people, and anybody who's coded here, you, know, you write painstakingly exactly what you, you have to understand the process very well that you want to change. If you get a comma wrong, it probably is going to crash, and it's going to be very frustrating. There's a new approach, machine learning, where in a way, the machines are writing parts of the algorithms. And the way that works is that 
um, in particular with the deep neural nets that we, we described, there's a basic kind of blank slate structure there. And if you feed it a lot of examples, and particularly the examples of, of uh, you know, successes and failures, cats versus dogs, the word yes versus the word no in, in French or English, whatever, then they ad the machine has a, 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 a way of adjusting all the weights on those nodes in between to optimize what the output is going to be. And then it figures out what the right weights need to be. And then when you show it new words or new pictures, it can apply those weights and recognize what the objects are. It works very well if you have sort of a set of inputs x going mapping to a set of outputs y. And we're just now seeing that that is a very broad set of class of problems that could be able to solve that way. Does, that, does that answer? Well, that, that's one way to do it. You, we, we think about algorithms in two big regimes. One has been around for a long time where you very painstakingly tell the computer exactly what you want it to do. And all of my computer science friends took at least one algorithms class in, during their degree where you learn different approaches to solving tough problems. Decision trees is one of them. What Eric is talking about is now there's this other regime where what uh, people who work on computers are doing is not telling them what to do in advance. They're building systems that can learn on their own. So that's not a classic algorithm, it's this, that's why we use a different label like machine learning for it. And, and decision trees is one class, these neural nets are sort of a different class. There's di machine learning encompasses a number of different ways of addressing that. Let's come right up here. And we're running short on time, we need to run exactly well, at 10 tails, so we're gonna try to do lightning rounds. Quick, so my name's Catherine from San Francisco and I love your work, thank you. Thank you. I'm curious if you've done any research in public sector, so either state and local, obviously federal's done some stuff, but. The thing in government in this country is it's all very highly replicable. It's all the same. So I'm curious if you see any um, interesting or if you've done any research there. We can outsource this question. There are a couple people here at the Ideas Festival that you need to talk to about this. Tim O'Reilly and Jennifer Palka are, are right on this issue, trying to make government work better by harnessing exactly these trends. Jennifer founded an organization called Code for America that parachutes geeks into different parts of government to help them do these kinds of things. It's awesome. The US Digital Service is out there trying to move the beast of the federal bureaucracy in these kinds of directions. It's slow work, but, but there are, there's grounds for optimism. Joanna? Quick question, great talk, quick question and quick, no, quick comments and then quick question. The quick comment is, from a perspective of computer science, Turing equivalence, crowds are the same as AI. Intelligence is yeah. just intelligence, whether it's natural or it's artificial. That's and a nice so it analogy. makes a lot of, it makes, it's, yeah, from natural computer science, it's not even an analogy. It, it, is, it's it is just different it's, it's ways it. to search, like you were just describing, cool. so this was one more. So you guys are, this is a really timely book and you should bring those together. Anyway, that's just a comment. I like the question is this trust thing. I think that was huge, and I, it just came up at the end. But I'm wondering, I think you're right. Most people are, are, are good, and we do overfocus on the negative examples, and that, yeah, that's absolutely true. But I still think there is something about the fact that there is a smartphone that creates the institutions, so we can't even, because of the credit, way credit works and everything else, we can't even screw up. So it does make us in a way better than we actually yeah. are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that does give us a liability that I, as a woman, feel safer huh. in an Uber, even though this is not a professional, but a because I taxi. know people know where I am yep, and there's yep. a record and it'll Amen. be emailed to my account and my husband has my emergency backup password if anything happens yeah. to yeah. me, you know. This is a great point, that part of what's happening is people are developing institutions and mechanisms that leverage these technologies. And if you, you know, for instance, can track where the person is, um, you can do even better than, than what we had before. So it's not just tapping into the trust that we had, but it's creating the incentives and the mechanism to do it. And, and, and I also want to just stress, it doesn't always work. There are lots of failed examples as well. Yeah. But one of the things that we see happening is people are experimenting, and, and when they get it right, it'll, they can scale it up. It reminds, your, your comment, which is fantastic, reminds me of the great quote from, I forget which jurist, who says, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Right? And, and there's a huge amount more sunlight in a lot of these things now. The other point you make, which I think is underappreciated, is taxi drivers often got ripped off by people who were jumping out the back seat of their car. That's not an issue with, with transport uh, network companies anymore, because they, like you say, they got your credit card. Next. Luce from the Financial Times. Thanks for a brilliant talk, very thought-provoking. Two very quick questions. First, if indeed you're right and Robert Gordon's wrong and we are on the cusp of this, um, and we're moving from um, judgment and opinion to data and to geeks, mm -hmm. how are the hippos gonna keep their high salaries? What are they gonna do to? And the second question is this division of labor to crowdsourcing from, from, from leadership in a way. What, what impact does that have for the future of politics and how we conduct politics. 
Eric, you take that yeah. second one. Oh, I want the first one. <laughs> no, no, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna grab the first one because Damn Bob it. Gordon's a, a, a dear friend, and so we, we discuss and debate this all the time. I'm having dinner with him in a, in a few weeks, and we do every summer to talk about these things. Uh, he's right about 90% of the stuff he writes about. He's wrong about this particular part, in my opinion. Oh, the stuff and that we write about, he's yeah. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's, but, but, you know, it, it's a lively, a li lively discussion. Uh, what, what's going to happen to hippos? Uh, they're going to have to change or they're going to lose their jobs. I mean, we don't think artificial intelligence and, and data-driven decision-making is um, going to take over all the decisions, but we think decision-makers who use those technologies will take over most or all of the decisions. There are fewer and fewer places where you can still can succeed by doing things the old way, which yeah. leaves you with the second question. Great, thanks. And I see we're just about out of time. <laughs> um, so I, I'm gonna punt this question in a particular way. We're gonna dive in on this in about 13 more minutes over at Pepke Auditorium uh, uh, with good. no less a colleague than Tom Friedman who's here with us. Tom, Eric, and I are gonna sit around and not talk just about the book, but talk about this very weird new world that we have created with machines, platforms, and crowds. And one of the things we have to talk about is how this is changing some of our political processes. Uh, uh, I'm gonna give away some of the content. Tom is a little bit jaundiced about this whole social media thing, for example. Yeah. And there is ample gr yeah. grounds for, for unhappiness and cynicism. We're gonna talk about it, uh, what's going on yeah. and can we fix some of the things that seem to be going so wrong. And, and so far, it's probably close to what we, we were talking with Joanna, that, that there are lots of failure modes as well as success modes, and I think we've explored a lot more of the failure modes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice way to say it, right? So Eric and I are big fans of the wisdom of crowds. There is also the madness of crowds, and we've seen some of that recently. So we've got a couple more minutes, but the good news is we can take this show on the road right. and go over to the other room. But, but go Oh, over here. Here, you're over here. Okay, great. One last uh, quick question. I'm a dermatologist, and I was wondering how this will apply to physicians wow. and to medicine, because it's a very interesting idea. Oh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So, yeah. so, so that was a slide I clicked over too quickly because I wanted to, to get to the questions. But there was a slide that I flashed up very quickly, which was showing medical imaging. Just as a machine can recognize dogs and cats, or recognize your Facebook friends, they can recognize cancer. They can recognize uh, objects. I know, I know about yeah. That. yeah. Yeah, so, so but, but the thing is that as with, with dermatologists, with oncologists, anything, the only thing they do isn't just looking at those right. images. Uh, most, almost every job consists of multiple dis different tasks. Uh, McKinsey, uh, James Manika have, have described this in great detail. When you uh, improve or optimize or automate one of those tasks, often the other tasks become more and more valuable, taking other, the other information that goes into the diagnosis, uh, interacting with the patients and managing that, motivating them to do the right thing. And so I think the job, that job and most jobs are going to be transformed as this very powerful tool comes in with laser-like power and, and improves one particular aspect of it. But rarely will the entire job disappear. It's more a matter of a transformation and using, leveraging those other components. And you bring up one really interesting transformation, which is having remote consultations with your clients. We talk about that in the book. It's a phenomenon that we call virtualization. A lot of processes where you kind of needed to be in person, you don't need to anymore. However, the the applying of treatments in dermatology and lots of other specialties, you still need to be in the same room with the human being to get that done. So like Eric says, I think important parts of what you currently do are going to change. Important parts are not going to change a lot. Well, I've already addressed that. We already cool. have the show that's virtual. All right, we have time for one more. Two criteria. It has to be an awesome question, yep. and it has to be short. And it has to be a question. <laughs> and it has to be a question. <laughs> and we'll give awesome short answers. Ma'am, do you have us? Br yes. Bring us home. My microphone. What happened that turned uh, aggregators, hotel and plane aggregators like Expedia and Travelocity and the others into platforms? A super short answer is we started all carrying around very powerful supercomputers in our pockets and that unleashed this aggregator, this platform world. When you gotta sit home and point and click on a big computer, you, you can't do nearly as many things. But, but um, in many of these spaces, and, and we describe it in the book, lots of examples, um, there are people sort of exploring slightly different models, and then sometimes you get it 90% right. right or 98% right, right, and it doesn't quite click, it doesn't scale. And although we have some principles in the book about what works, it's not like a literal cookbook that we can guarantee each time you do all these items you're, you're going to succeed. Um, there's, a, there's a bit of uh, luck and exploration, and so that is going to be, that, that's part of it as well, is, is working through all that. So we will take, you, take this uh, show over the other side. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you very much.